Welcome everyone. I see that we have quite a wide range of people joining us. So, so happy you can make it um, tonight for me. <laughs> I'm in DC suburbs of Maryland. Um, so welcome to Control Unleashed. It's a fabulous program created by Leslie McDevitt. Um, and if you were able to see the um, cooperative care presentation from Dr. Lynn Lynn Cow, um, she is fabulous. And that is another um, outreach, I'm going to say, of Control Unleashed. Um, she is a Control Unleashed cert certified instructor. So um, hopefully you get as much out of uh, this presentation as I'm sure you got out of hers. So without further ado, I will go ahead and get started. No, oh, let me make sure that my mouse is going to work. There we go. Okay, so if you are not familiar with Control Unleashed, um, it is a program based on Lovely McDevitt's books and DVDs. Um, and it is a series of foundation behaviors. So sort of laying that foundation work with your dog, building a um, strong foundation that you can build behavior onto. So we are focused on what she refers to as conversational training. So it's not so much, I tell the dog to sit and the dog sits. It's a lot more transactional, paying attention to what your dog is communicating by their body language, responding to that, setting them up to be successful. Um, I like to say that there are no wrong answers in Control Unleashed. So if for some reason you ask your dog, can they do something? And the answer is no. Um, that lets me know that I need to change something. I have not set the dog up for success. They're not comfortable. They're too distracted. What do I need to change um, to help them be successful? And then also relaxation. So we want to be sure that our dogs are able to be calm and relaxed, that they know what that feels like. Um, unfortunately, there are dogs out there who do not know how to calm themselves down or how to relax. They're always on or they're always way up here. Um, and we are trying to help them learn how to bring themselves down. Um, pattern games are a huge part of Control Unleashed. We're not going to touch on that tonight. Um, I'm hoping to do another webinar um, in the future that will go over pattern games and um, cooperative counter conditioning, um, since Lynn Lynn already did cooperative care. And then um, I'm, I might be able to get to everyday applications. We'll sort of see how it goes. Okay. What is it and why do we use it? All right. Well, I sort of did this already. <laughs> um, but why do we use Control Unleashed? So it establishes a system of communication, as I said, two-way communication. Um, it builds a strong relationship. It gives the learner agency. So again, the dog is part of that conversation. I'm not telling the dog what to do. I am um, helping the dog make better behavior choices. And it follows the golden rule. So treating them how you would like to be treated. And what we're going to focus on tonight are the foundation behaviors. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the books, this is um, mostly the stuff that was um, from the first book. And relaxation and biofeedback is where we're going to start. So Dr. Karen Overall um, was Leslie's mentor, and she developed these two protocols. So um, she has a relaxation protocol that's available online, and it is sort of a paint by numbers for um, utilizing mat work and helping your dog learn how to relax. And um, it's there's a lot of information out there about how she designed it, why she designed it that way, and why it works. But it essentially is one of our tools that we utilize to help dogs learn how to be calm in different situations. So if you are not familiar with it and haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you um, check it out. You should be able to Google it and I'm sure it will pop up. Biofeedback is what we tend to uh, refer to as take a breath in the Control Unleashed universe. So this is essentially using deep breathing to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So, 
we're going to watch this video on take a breath and it'll give you a little more of an idea of what we're talking about so let me pull this up here we go oh hang on one second i'm going to pause that actually sorry technology i forgot to share my sound so i want to be sure that you guys can hear it okay here we go Um, and also just to let you know, there is no audio until it's live video. So you are not missing anything. <laughs> You're not hearing anything. So essentially, we're focusing on the breath. Taking deep breaths help to calm your mind and body. And there are two different methods. Method one is air scenting. So having the dog smell something, a strong scent. And number two is modeling where you take a nice deep breath, which causes the dog to mimic you. So this just talks a little bit about how you can see these breaths, these nice deep breaths. So this is my dog Piper with a nice nostril flare there. And there are a couple other different ways that it presents. So in the next video, you're going to see what that looks you can like start with different with some dogs. More subtle breathing so that you can see what you're looking for. There was an inhale. Here you're going to see her lift her head up a little bit to take to smell. Here her nose moves a bit as she's inhaling. And in this next one, you're going to see a deeper inhale right there. So here's a different angle. We start to get a wider nostril flare. Right there. That's a more subtle breath. And then we finish with another wider nostril flare right there. So here is another dog. You're going to see that it looks different with each dog. There was a very obvious inhale. This dog has a bit more of a poof. You can almost see it a little clearer behind the nose. Right there, nice deep inhale. Here's a puppy learning to take a breath. So again, it's a little more subtle, but you can definitely see the inhale, again, almost even behind the nose. This dog has a more obvious nostril flare. Oh, sorry. Again, it looks a little bit different on each dog. dog is the most obvious by far. We get a very distinct nostril flare and a bit of a poof. So don't worry if your dog doesn't look like this, if it's not this obvious. Again, over time, as they figure out that you just want them to breathe, you may get these more obvious nostril flares because they want to be really sure that you see it. Um, so if you did have trouble hearing the audio, I know it is soft. I will, um, drop a link to the, um, this is available on YouTube on my YouTube page. Um, so I'll drop a link in there so you can actually go watch it. Cause I know sometimes it skips or you can't hear the audio. Um, but hopefully that sort of gave you an idea of what we're talking about with take a breath and what our goals are there. Oops, I don't want to do that again. Okay. So in um, coordination with Take a Breath, we also um, utilize mat work. And so um, essentially we're talking about having a specific place for the dog to relax um, 
And ideally, this is a place that they would stay um, until release. And so again, the relaxation protocol is sort of a great way to build in that stay. And I'm this is just a sort of fast forwarded video of me doing the relaxation protocol. So you can sort of see um, what it entails. And I'm really bad. I keep an eye on the chat. So when questions come up, I have to <laughs> like sort of peek. Um, and I'm going to answer it because take a breath is, it's something that is, it's the concept is so simple, but people really can struggle with it. And I think it's because we get so bogged down in training. Um, and take a breath is actually not something that we want you to think of as training. And we don't want it to look like training to the dog. And I think that's sort of the key. And so what we do when we start to train this is we set up this scenario where you've got treats and you're just staring at your dog's nose. And I mean, there's just this intense staring, trying to see them breathe. And the dog, you know, can completely sense that, okay, I'm supposed to be doing something here. And they have no idea what it is that we're looking for because we're not cueing anything. We're not doing anything with our body. We're just intently staring at them. And so a lot of times this sort of sets up not exactly what we're looking for. So I like to tell people that we're sort of, if you're into yoga, if you're into meditation, you know, I like to think of it as just being Zen. You're just there in the moment with your dog. And that I start my classes with the modeling method because I don't want them even looking at their dog's nose. I want them just literally taking nice deep breaths themselves because they're calming down. And then hopefully their dog is starting to do that. And I, I have found, I crack myself up, but I have found that I flare my nostril when I'm doing take a breath. So when I'm teaching people and when I'm doing it with my dog, I do a nice. And so that modeling method sort of takes the pressure off seeing your dog breathe. And I really have them focus more on the dog's overall body language. So if the dog was very excitedly wagging their tail, does that tail start to slow down as we're doing our breathing together? If their ears were really up and intense, do they start to relax? Does their body start to relax? If they were sitting very upright or lying very upright, do they start to shift over to their hip? And so it's just that overall relaxation that we're working for, working towards, excuse me. Um, and so that's where I like to start. But the other way that you could do it is you could capture air scenting outside of actually even trying to train it. So let's say you're in the kitchen and you're cooking and you're, you can see your dog's head go up and they're, they're doing that air scenting where it's like, ooh, ooh, there's something that smells really good in here. Anytime your dog does that, you can feed. With take a breath, we're not marking, we're not clicking, we're not telling the dog anything, we're simply feeding when they breathe. And so anytime they do that nice air scenting or deep breathing, you can capture it by just feeding them in the moment. You don't have to say anything, don't do anything, but positive reinforcement works because the behavior that you're reinforcing happens more often. And if you can capture those moments of air scenting or deeper breathing, your dog is going to start offering that behavior more often, and that should also help you to be able to see it. So sorry that I went off on that hole, <laughs> but I do think take a breath is one of those things that can be very difficult for people um, who have read the book, but haven't had any coaching with a certified instructor to sort of get that concept. And I guarantee you are not the only one, Kyla, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but... <laughs> you know, in my classes, it's the one that a lot of people struggle with because it's, it's so simple, but it feels complex. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go on and do the video for mat work. So this is, um, just a quick, um, uh, relaxation protocol. I think it's actually the second set. Um, so you can see sort of what that looks like.
So just a couple things I want to point out before we go to the next slide. You may have noticed that the brown dog, um, Obi-Wan, was sitting and Piper, the black dog, was lying down. Um, they were both offering their default behaviors, and we're going to talk about what that is, but his default behavior is a sit and hers is a down. And so even though we were doing um, mat work for both of them, Piper has previously gone through the relaxation protocol and she's very good at settling on the mat while another dog is working. So you may have noticed that I was doing all of those different things around Obi. Um, and I was just periodically feeding Piper for remaining settled on her mat. And so once you've sort of gone through this or done a lot of mat work with your dog, that's what it's sort of going to look like is they're sort of watching from their mat, watching the world go by, remaining settled, periodically getting reinforced for that. Um, but they're able to do that while other things are going on. So I was essentially working with Obi, um, who was sitting on his mat, and I was just feeding her for being calm and relaxed on her mat. So this is a nice example of how you can do the relaxation protocol with two dogs at once. Um, just making the note that one dog already was conditioned to a mat. So I wasn't starting fresh with both of them, which would be a little more difficult. Again, it likes to do it twice. Okay, so that leads us right into default behavior. Um, so when we're talking about this, I like to say capital D, capital B <laughs> default behavior um, because it is a very specific body position or behavior that the dog does that is always reinforced. Um, so typically it's going to be sitting or lying down, although it can also be orienting to the trainer. So um, basically the dog checking in with the trainer. The difficulty with that is it can be sort of arbitrary. It's a little bit harder to um, really be um, confident that that's what your dog is doing or to really reinforce that. Um, but that certainly is a potential default behavior. Personally, when working in classes, I like to sort of stick with a sit or a down because again, it's easier for um, the handler to really see that the dog is um, specifically offering that behavior. Um, stationing could potentially be a default behavior, but it would be specific to one specific context. So where that station is available, where they're stationing versus what we typically mean by default behavior is something that the dog can offer in any context. So again, the idea of default behavior is that it is a specific behavior that the dog offers, typically when they're confused or when they're not sure what else to do or it's their go-to. So if you think about what happens when you get a crinkly bag of treats, um, or you're getting their meal or anything that your dog wants, what is it that your dog does? For most dogs, it's going to be either sitting pretty right in front of you, like, Ooh, do you see me sitting? I'm ready for my treat. Um, or it's going to be a nice down. So they're lying down waiting for those things. That is their default behavior, the one that they tend to offer. Now, when within the context of control and leash, what we're talking about with that capital D, capital B default behavior is that we condition that behavior to the point that it can actually override instinctive behavior. So essentially, any time your dog is offering that behavior, you're going to reinforce it. That doesn't always necessarily mean you're going to feed it. So if my dog sits by the door because they want to go outside, I'm going to reinforce that behavior by opening the door and letting them out. Um, if my dog sits because they're asking for um, a treat, you know, I can offer a treat at that. If they're, you know, sitting because they're asking for my attention, I can reinforce that by giving them my attention. So we can do a play session or if they wanted to snuggle. So there are different ways that you can reinforce a behavior, assuming that what you're offering is something that is motivating to the dog. It's either what they were asking for, or it's something that they truly enjoy um, or are willing to work for. So that's, um, different types of reinforcement, but the idea is that your dog figures out that no matter what the context, no matter what's going on, they can offer this behavior and always get rewarded for it. And, and by doing so, 
a truly conditioned default behavior can actually override instinctive behaviors. So if you have an anxious dog, if you have a reactive dog, if you have a fearful dog, this default behavior can actually override in a situation where they might face a trigger or a scary situation or um, some other things that could be stressful, that becomes what they do in those situations versus, you know, the lunging and the barking, trying to make something go away, for example. So that is a very powerful tool um, to have in your toolbox. And that's what we're talking about. And I make that distinction because um, I love Leslie's joke that she's a lazy trainer. Um, she doesn't want to have to tell her dog what to do. So she utilizes a lot of context cues. So things that are happening in the environment that essentially tell the dog what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Um, so for example, um, I could be, I could place the mat down in front of my dog and my mat automatically knows that they're supposed to go and lay down on the mat because I've presented it. So I, I didn't say anything. Um, you could take that as a visual cue, but again, it's sort of that context cue. And we're going to get into some of what those other things are. So those could technically be considered default behaviors because the dog is offering them without it being cued. Um, but it's not that specific one that we're talking about conditioning. So I hope that makes sense. And I didn't just confuse you more um, by going into that. But so this is just a quick video of an example of conditioning a default behavior. So again, this is Obi-Wan and his default behavior is a sit. Ah, and apparently now, of course, this time, instead of playing again, it went to the next one. My goodness. Okay, so we started off with um, sort of conditioning that default behavior, reinforcing that behavior of sitting in the house when there isn't a whole lot going on. And then you saw a little bit of me doing it out in the backyard, um, which is very stimulating for Obi-Wan. Um, and so I really wanted to condition that he could offer that behavior in that context. Um, and then I also did an example of a stationing default behavior in this case um, with Piper. So when we first got Piper, I had young kids, which means that food was constantly hitting the floor in the kitchen. Um, so I did a very strong stationing behavior so that the second I walked into the kitchen, she would immediately go to that spot and lie down. Um, and it was so strongly conditioned that even though my kids are now 10 and eight, um, she still offers that behavior as soon as I walk into the kitchen because she knows if she goes and lays down in that spot, she's going to get rewarded for it. Um, and she'll stay there. I mean, I can be working on something for 15, 20 minutes and she'll still be waiting for that treat at the end. Um, sometimes I'll still reinforce her a couple times while she's there um, or sometimes I'll just release her at the end um, and reinforce it there. So those are a couple different um, examples of default behavior. Jessica asked a question, which I'm really glad she did. So there are some dogs who you can go through the relaxation protocol 
And yes, they're staying on the mat. Yes, they're not moving around. Yes, they're not vocalizing, but they are not relaxed. Um, so there are two different options and actually you can combine the two of them, but I would, I would incorporate take a breath, Jessica. So because take a breath is stimulating that parasympathetic nervous system, um, you could be doing the relaxation product protocol. <laughs> yes. Um, you could be doing the relaxation protocol and, um, at the end when you're supposed to treat, you could, you could cue take a breath. Um, so, you know, it would be take a step back and then come back and treat. So you take a step back and you come back, cue a breath and then treat. Um, there is also a um, protocol that Leslie came up with that is um, called down for the count. And I'm sort of mad at myself because I don't actually have a slide on it here, which I should. Um, but it was actually designed for that purpose is to help dogs um, who struggle to relax on the mat. So either the dog who is constantly in working mode or the dog who is trying to get the treats to start so that yes, they're lying down, but oh, that's not working. So I'm going to shift to this hip or oh, that's not working. So then I'm going to move my position um, or maybe they're vocalizing. So a dog that has trouble remaining still on the mat, a dog that has trouble relaxing on the mat, um, down for the count is where you basically use counting to start to build some duration of calmness and stillness. And again, you can incorporate breathing. So you start off just by counting to one and then feeding. Can your dog stay still and calm for that one count? So one and feed, one and feed, one and feed. If your dog was successful um, at breathing and remaining calm for that amount of time, we can start to count up to two. One, two, feed, one, two, feed. I could be cueing, take a breath the entire time while I'm counting. So this is um, what uh, Leslie and Dr. Overall do that's sort of a tap on the nose. There are all different ways you can cue, take a breath. It doesn't have to be that, but I also tend to do that. So I could be cueing, breathing as I'm counting. One, two, and feed. Um, and then you, you, know, you can count up as high as you need to go um, to incorporate that. So yes, that is a great question. Sometimes people worry about counting. If you are familiar with the pattern game, one, two, three pattern game. So there's a one, two, three walking pattern game where every time you say three, the dog gets a treat. And sometimes people get concerned that there might be confusion. Um, I personally have not found that because it is a, um, it's a different feel. So yeah, there's context cues. So we're on the mat and the way that we're counting. So you'll notice I was doing a very calm, slow count. So it wasn't when I count one, two, three, I go like when I'm doing the pattern game, it's like one, two, three, and then I treat. So it's a, a very sort of high pitched, very like, here's the three. And it's a definite different tone versus when I would be doing something like down for the count where it would be one, two, three, and then feed or one, two, three, four feet. So it sort of has a different feel to it. Um, that being said, if you thought that it might be confusing for your dog, um, you are always welcome to use something else. So instead of counting, it could be ABC. And the same thing goes for the one, two, three pattern game. You don't have to use one, two, three for the pattern game. It could also be ABC or it could be duck, duck, goose. <laughs> um, it's just that same repeating pattern and that final phrase um, means that the dog, there's gonna be a treat available to the dog. Um, so that is down for the count. Um, there are videos of that. I believe there is one on um, Leslie's YouTube page. Um, and again, I'm, I apologize for not having that on here. I definitely should have had a slide for that. But um, if you have any questions on that, you can definitely check out her page. Um, and I believe I have a link to that on the last slide here. And I can also drop that in the chat towards the end. So going from default behavior and mat work, we can utilize those two things um, for again, helping the dog learn how to control their arousal level. Um, so this is technically a pattern game, but I like to control it in the foundations because it goes hand in hand with those um, foundation concepts. 
Um, and this is sort of the order that Leslie actually would teach it in. Um, and so the pattern is essentially dog gets excited, dog calms down. Dog gets excited, dogs calm, dog calms down. So they're they're learning how to regulate their arousal level, um, utilizing these concepts that we have already taught them. So we should definitely have already conditioned default behavior, and we should have a fairly strong map behavior at this point. Um, and so you can have the mat available again as a context cue. So the mat is there. So it might help the dog figure out that when we stop the play, they can go over and settle on their mat. We can be incorporating take a breath with this. The dog could also just be offering their default behavior. So essentially what we're looking for is we're going to do some play with the dog, whatever activity gets them excited. We're going to bring them up, but we don't want to get to that red zone. We don't want to get to the point where the dog sort of loses their mind and they're no longer operant. We can get right up to that, but we don't want to actually get there. So dog gets a little excited and then we stop our play and we wait. Again, we've already conditioned default behavior. We've already done mat work. So either of those, the dog should be offering because We've stopped the play and they want to play and we're not asking for anything else. So that's going to be their go-to. So the dog is going to offer their default behavior. It could be on the mat. It could be off the mat. Um, and then we could also be incorporating some take a breath. But again, our end goal is to see the dog come back down. And by doing that, we're going to reinforce it by restarting the game. Um, personally, if I'm incorporating take a breath, I also do treats. So if I'm just waiting for a nice default behavior or a nice settle on the mat, I'll immediately restart the game. If I'm specifically asking for breathing, I'm going to be feeding while they're breathing, and then I'm going to restart the game. Um, I unfortunately did not go in, and um, I could have gotten some other off switch uh, stuff from the, my classes, but this is the one that I had for the last webinar. Um, so thankfully, Wendy Katz shared um, with us her off switch video. I'll try and post, post a, an off switch on my YouTube page. Um, so if you subscribe, I'll try and add that on here shortly so you can see some other examples. But this is what off switch looks like. I don't think I can make it bigger. There you can see her cueing a breath. And another one. This is better. <laughs> Racks me up every time the second dog comes in. I like to train too. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. So you can see this was some fairly, um, fairly relaxed play. Part of it is because they're indoors. Um, and so you may want to start at a lower level of excitement, especially if you have a dog that struggles with once they get up, they can't come back down. Um, and so you're gonna want to figure out how much play, how much excitement you wanna do when you first start introducing this. If you have a dog that gets easily frustrated, we're gonna wanna make sure that we're really setting them up for success, making it really obvious what we're looking for. So maybe do a little bit of mat work or maybe reinforce default behavior before we do just a tiny bit of play. And then we're gonna pause and see if they can go right to that. Um, so just some things to think about if you are starting off switch. Okay, which brings us to whiplash turn. So you're gonna notice a theme in the next 
couple ones that we're going to be doing. Um, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Um, but they're all sort of working on this concept of the dog disengaging from something or turning away from something in the environment and re-engaging with their person. We tend to refer to it as orienting um, because it doesn't have to be eye contact. It's just some sort of reconnection. I don't care if my dog is looking at my treat pouch because my dog is still focused on me and not the environment within the, the context of orienting. So whiplash turn, again, is a pattern, but it's part of the foundation building this um, idea of the dog remaining focused with you or re-engaging with you from the environment. And we set it up by placing a treat on the ground, which allows you to get behind your dog so that when you call them, they are turning towards you. And so the idea is you mark the head turn and by marking it, your dog is gonna whip around the rest of the way to get the treat. So that's why it's called whiplash turn. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so that's whiplash turn. I, you can see the joke at the bottom. If you don't get dizzy, you're not doing it right. <laughs> I do actually get dizzy when I do this exercise. Um, so if, and I do, I do also like to mention modifications. If you are somebody that has um, trouble doing that sort of maneuvering around, there are a couple different ways you can adjust this. Um, if you needed a little more time, you can put several treats down for your dog to eat to give you time to get behind them. Um, if you have trouble leaning over or moving like that, you can have um, two different people. So the dog takes turns, um, sorry, <laughs> alternately turns away from one person toward the other, and then the other person calls them back. Um, so that's one way to um, make a modification. Sorry, I'm just going to close the door really fast because um, uh, people are coming home. So um, those are a couple different ways that you can modify. I don't recommend tossing the treat away from you because that is, um, it's a little bit different than placing the treat down. It's a difference in sometimes that will rev the dog up a little higher. Um, also, it might interrupt the pattern because the dog is having to find it. Um, so I definitely prefer placing of the treat versus tossing. So that's why I like using two different people um, rather than one person tossing it away from them if they can't get behind. Okay, moving right along. Piper. So that brings us right into reorienting. So whiplash turn sets up this behavior of reorienting to the person. And now we're shifting, and that one is cued by saying the dog's name. The idea of this one is that we are not cueing it, that it should be something that the dog does automatically. So the idea is that whenever the dog goes through a threshold, so changing environments, coming out of the crate, going out the door, walking into a training class, um, especially going from a less stimulating environment to a more stimulating environment, which is happening in all of those scenarios. We want the first thing that the dog does to be orienting to their person, to the handler, to the trainer. Um, the easiest way to train this concept is from a crate. Um, and so that's why we start it from there. So I'm gonna do a quick video so you can see what that looks like. So go ahead and step one. There we go. Yes. Beautiful. That's what we wanted right there. So that was a perfect reorientation. So see if she'll go back in for you one more time. <laughs> Good. Beautiful. Nice. All right, so we're going to do one more. Oops, I guess I didn't do that. Um, so that was sort of early on in it. As we go forward, I would have had her delay her marking until the dog is fully turned around, but we start to condition it by 
um, again, marking right when the dog is at that point where their head is turning. So then they come the rest of the way. Um, so that's the idea of reorienting. And then I like to do the next um, reorienting practice um, at the door, at the front door. And there is a pattern game called Give Me a Break, um, where you set a treat down and you walk away from the dog and the dog has to come get you to cue you to put the next treat down. That goes really well for this reorienting concept. And so you'll sort of see how I put those two together um, to train a dog to automatically reorient at a doorway. Nice timing on your click. Good. Good. Right there, click. Yes, very nice. Good. Good. And so, yep, exactly right, Mike. So you're just going to keep working your way towards the right there. Yep, same spot. Good. Good. That same spot. Mm -hmm. Good. Good, a little bit further. Very nice. All right, and one more, and then we're gonna try putting it on that step. Good. Beautiful, yep. Lovely. Good, and let's end right there. So he has to leave the door and come get you, and then you come back and do the next one. So he sort of did it the first time, and then, so here, there we go, that's it. Perfect. Good. All right, and this next one, yep, that's perfect. That's just what I was gonna tell you to do. Put it right down there. Make sure you can, yeah, he got it. And then he, yes, good. So yep, you're just gonna put it right on the mat. I don't think he saw you put that one down. Beautiful. Yeah, so we're going to want it a little bit closer <laughs> next time. Yes, that was great. So, I'm sorry, I'm gonna... so you're going as if you were going to come outside normally. So you're going to let him out. When he comes out, what we're hoping for is he automatically turns back and you're going to say yes and give him a treat. Yes, exactly. Good boy. All right, so let's do it one more time and then we'll come on out. Beautiful. I love watching stuff like that. <laughs> um, so Jackie, yes. And for both of these dogs that you saw the video, that was the first time that they were doing these, this concept. Um, and that's why I like utilizing Give Me a Break because it already puts them in that pattern of turning back to the person. Um, unfortunately, that first video, there was a big gap between when the door was closed and when you saw it open. Um, we did slowly open the door. So kind of like you saw in this one, it was like open an inch and then maybe open a couple inches. And so we do it slowly so that the dog um, is successful at turning away from that open door and re-engaging. Um, and in this one, she had to stand there because the door wouldn't stay open on its own. So neither of those were like the perfect example of what we would want for our setup, but they both of these um, clients did a great job. Um, at going through this protocol with their dogs to set up this idea of reorienting. Um, before I move on, I did want to answer, somebody asked a question about default behavior. And um, is the default behavior the goal or should it be a relaxed version of the behavior? So when we're talking about conditioning default, they can be in an alert sit or an alert down. That's totally fine. If we are talking in the context of off switch behavior, we would want them to 
to go from an alert default to a more relaxed. So if the dog sat but was totally alert and just quivering, waiting for you to throw the ball, I, that's when I might incorporate take a breath. So, you know, helping them to actually bring that arousal level down before I restarted the game. So hopefully that answered your question. And if not, feel free to ask again. All right. So hopefully since I've been answering questions as we go, we're not going to run out. No, nope, that's one we just did. Okay. Ooh, which brings us to look at that. <laughs> um, which is probably truly the most complex of the um, control unleashed concepts. And um, it's unfortunately the one that while most widely known is also probably um, most misrepresented. Um, and uh, so yeah, <laughs> so not gonna go, I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole. So um, the idea is if you think about what the traditional, um, if we're talking, you know, I'm going to say 20 years ago in dog training, the idea was if your dog would get easily distracted or your, uh, your dog would get reactive or any of those things, the way to fix that was to have the dog solely focused on you. So it would be stuff like teaching, watch me. And the idea was that the dog would be looking at you all the time and ignoring everything out in the environment. And that was really hard to be successful. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's hard to expect someone to to have their dog looking solely at them and not paying attention to anything else in their environment. Um, and so it put a lot of pressure on the trainer um, and it put a lot of pressure on the dog. And um, I was just listening to um, the, if you're familiar with the Michael Shikashio podcast, The Bitey End of the Dog, um, he recently had Leslie on there and he asked how she came up with this concept. Um, and she said that with her rebel personality, um, because it was basically the opposite of what you were supposed to do, you were supposed to teach the dog to look at you. Um, rewarding the dog for doing the opposite of that sort of um was something was sort of something that appealed to her um but having said that it really isn't about looking at something else and um she has said if she could go back and rename it she would but at this point it's so well known the idea is not so much to cue your dog to look at something else it's really about teaching the dog how to report on something um, that is out in their environment. And so there are a lot of different ways that they can report. It doesn't mean that they have to fully look at that. Sometimes the dogs will just do a quick eye movement. Sometimes it'll be an ear twitch in the direction. Um, Really, when you have a dog that gets really good at look at that and has done it a really long time, what you end up with, ironically, is a dog that never looks away from the person. <laughs> um, so you go, where's the person? And the dog just stares at you. Yeah, I know there's somebody out there. I'm fine. <laughs> where's the dog? Yeah, there's a dog out there. I'm fine. I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, and so it's really funny because a lot of um, certified instructors want to demonstrate this and their dogs never look away. <laughs> they never look at anything. Um, so that sort of makes me laugh. How you get to that, how you get from this concept of rewarding the dog for looking at something to ending up with a dog that never looks away is again, these context cues. So as we go through and teach this concept, something in the environment actually becomes a context cue to orient to the person. So it's a behavior change. Dog's going along, dog notices something in the environment, dog reports it to the person. So they're immediately disengaging and re-engaging with their person. Hopefully you've started to hear in that theme over and over again. Um, so that's how they all sort of work together. Um, let me move forward here for one second. Okay, so how we um, 
one of the one of the ways that um, we like to do this, how to teach this concept, is from the mat. So once you have gone through mat work and got your dog to settle on the mat and stay there until released, be pretty chill on the mat. Um, then we incorporate mat steps two through four. And these are essentially steps that we go through that teaches the dog this look at that concept. Here is the key. We start with something that is either neutral to the dog or that the dog is comfortable with, has the positive association. So I am not starting with a dog that is reactive to other dogs, I am not teaching this game in the context of that dog seeing other dogs. Why? Because I don't want this game to be associated with that immediate arousal level up here. And I say that having made that mistake. So with my dog Piper, I knew just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> So I understood that you clicked when the dog looked at the other dog, and then you start to ask them to, to point out the other dog. And that's where we started. And essentially, I poisoned the cue. What happened was my dog heard that cue and immediately went, oh, there's another dog in the environment. Where's the other dog? And it just raised her arousal level right through the roof. Hackles go up. Um, that's not what we're looking for. We want to introduce this concept as a fun game. Can you point out something in the environment? Yes, I see that person over there. Good job. Now, where's that person? Oh, yep, yeah, now they're over there. Lots and lots of practice with neutral objects, people that they know, people that they're comfortable with, objects that have no meaning, um, so that they learn this really fun game. And then slowly, we start to introduce that concept into environments that might be stressful and or um, things that might be a potential trigger. But again, the first time we do this, we're setting the dog up for success. So if I've been doing this with a dog that's like, they've got look at that, they'll, they'll report something to me and we've never done it with another dog. The first time I'm going to have a helper dog that is very calm, very chill, sending all the right signals. And I'm going to have them, depending on the dog, they might be a football field away from the dog that I'm working with so that I know for a fact that this dog is not going to go over threshold, that they're going to be able to see that other dog and not react. And that's how we're going to play the game. So sorry for, again, going down that long thing, but I just wanted to sort of um, touch on that. And so also note that it, that is the other reason that it's different than the engage disengage. So if you're familiar with that, um, there is um, a protocol for dogs that are reactive where you start, there's a, it's a two-step. You start by clicking when they notice the other dog, and then you eventually shift to waiting until the dog orients back to you to click. Um, and that's a little bit different than look at that. With look at that, we never start to wait. Um, and I personally feel like we get, that's why we start to get that lessening and lessening of looking because we're not waiting so long between the dog noticing and the dog coming back. I, th I feel like there's a little more lag time with the engage disengage. Um, Whereas with this one, we're setting it up so that the dog isn't getting stuck looking and having to take a while to assess, um, but they're very easily able to disengage. So let's, and I, I do know that this is just a lot of philosophy and talking. So hopefully watching this will help clarify. There was an eye movement there. You didn't catch that. Another eye movement. Two eye movements. And I missed them both. <laughs> so that was a setup where I had... Um, he, my daughter moving around and he was pointing her out. Okay. 
And this is later on when we're doing more of a real life scenario. Nice breath there. I cued another breath right there. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that one because <laughs> that's not my video. Um, so hopefully you saw a couple different concepts there. Um, so we he had learned the concept of look at that. We did it with some neutral, um, positive, did it inside first. We moved to outside with my daughter. Um, and then I did a setup in the backyard, which again, I said the backyard can be very stimulating for him. He struggles with dogs going by. Um, and sometimes neighbor dogs. So this was early in the morning. There wasn't anything else happening. And the puppy in the other yard was out and that puppy's pretty chill. That puppy didn't bark a whole lot um, and just happened to be out there relaxing. And so I thought it was a great time to practice look at that. Um, you'll notice I have a couple different things set up to hopefully um, keep him under threshold. He's on his mat. So we've got a bit of stationing there something that he's already associated with being calm on and um, relaxed and remaining in place. I do have a leash on just in case something did happen that he would want to go over um, and see so I could prevent him from running up to the fence um, because then he would definitely go over threshold. Um, and then I also, when he did start to go over threshold, you saw that little wolf, he started to get up, but he was able to come back down. Um, I incorporated take a breath to help bring that arousal level back down after it went up higher than I wanted. Um, so, so, you know, hopefully you're starting to see again how things go hand in hand and how you can utilize them all together. Um, yes, you can. Yes, there is a cue for look at that. Um, the cue is actually a question. Um, and Leslie changed it to that. So essentially the cue is where is, insert. <laughs> um, so where is the dog? Where is the person? Um, if it's a specific person that they know, where is Piper? Um, the idea is that by ask, making it a question, it's more clear that you're having a conversation with your dog. And that's really what look at that is. It's a conversation about the environment. I'm not asking my dog to look at something. Um, I'm saying, are you aware that there's another dog out in the environment? Well, yes, I am aware. And it's over there. Um, and that also, there are several different rewardable responses. The dog may remain looking at you. The dog may just do an ear in the direction of whatever's out there. The dog may just do the eye shift, with hope, which hopefully you noticed with Obi, there were a lot of eye movements um, where he was pointing things out. There were some ear twitches, but I don't know that you can see it because of the angle. Um, they may do a quick head turn. They may do a full head turn. Any of those are rewardable responses. And so... Again, we're not cueing a specific behavior, we're having a conversation. And there are several different ways that your dog can respond to that conversation that are rewardable responses. And if the dog goes over threshold, 
it's because we didn't set them up correctly. And having said that, I understand that life happens and there are going to be times that something unexpected happens and your dog is going to go over threshold. And, and I totally get that. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about when you are doing a deliberate setup where, okay, we're going to practice this concept and we're going to, you know, build on this that we want to, as much as possible, try and control those variables so that the environment is set up in a way that our dog is able to be successful in that context. And if we do miscalculate that we're able to take a step back and you know reevaluate, change our setup and, and hopefully be successful, um, there are gonna be times when it's just get out of Dodge. Um, and just a remembrance that if your dog is reacting, they are not in operant mode and there's no learning that occurs at that point. So it, you know, that's where the emergency handling stuff comes into place because we just need to get out of there because um, the dog is not going to be learning anything and we're not going to be developing the um, learning history that we're looking for. So I am going to go back here because I know there were a couple questions about look at that. So hopefully I answered the queuing one. Um, the last thing that I want to say on that is um, I, I don't, you probably didn't hear a whole lot of queuing in the video. I think I was queuing when my daughter was walking around. I was not queuing when the puppy was there. What I have found um, that I do once I get to real life scenarios is I do not keep asking the dog to point out environmental stimulus. So let's say there was a dog walking by, I'm not going to keep asking him to point out the other dog. I think of the cue in that context more as a heads up. Hey, there's a dog out there. I don't, I don't want that dog to sneak up on you and you not be aware that it's there. So I'm going to say, where's the dog so that you know there's something out there. You're, a, you're able to see it, assess it, report it. Um, and at that point, I'm going to let the dog tell me, do they need to continue that conversation? If my dog continues to point out that other dog, I'm going to continue to mark and treat. Yes, I see that dog. Thank you for telling me. Here's your cookie. Oh, yes, he's still over there. That's right. Um, at some point, my dog is going to stop indicating the other dog either the other dog goes out of sight or he gets comfortable enough that he doesn't feel the need to report it anymore. And at that point, I know that my dog is comfortable and the conversation is over. Um, when we're in the learning the concept, I will continue to cue it. So like when my daughter was there, I might have asked several times, um, but there probably you didn't hear it a whole lot, first of all, because I was talking softly. Um, but also because he was probably offering the behavior before I even had a chance to cue it. Um, so maybe I cued it initially and then he like points her out again before I even have a chance to say, where is she? Um, and I'm always going to click and treat that. Um, and then if, if there had been a pause, I would have cued it again. But in those real life scenarios, I personally don't continue to ask him. Once he's aware that there's something out there, I'm going to let him choose whether or not to continue to report it, or does he want to just keep going on his walk? Um, does he want to move further away, get a little more distance? Um, I'm always going to encourage that choice. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. And if we need more clarification, let me know. So I'm just going to keep going through these questions now. Um, or look at that and up and down kind of the same. That is a great question, Jackie. What I will say is... <laughs> <laughs> that I tend to, so if you're not familiar with up and down, this is a pattern game. So yes, I will go over this in the next one, but it's essentially a pattern game where you put the treat down on the ground and then the dog looks back up at you. I sort of use up down as a cheat when the dog and handler team aren't really strong with look at that. Either they haven't done a whole lot of foundation work with it. Maybe we're not ready for that real life scenario. Um, I will utilize up and down for that same context. But the difference is in, in utilizing up and down, you're marking for two different things. And look at that, you're always going to mark as soon as the dog reports the other thing. So if the dog is looking at you and their ear twitches, that's what you're marking. If you're playing up and down when the dog looks at you, that's what you're marking. But 
if the dog eats the treat and notices something in the up and down game, you're waiting for them to re-engage with you to mark. Um, so there is that sort of waiting for them to re-engage. So in that sense, it's almost a little bit more like engage, disengage, except that you're not cueing them to look, you're allowing them to look. Um, whereas in look at that, it would have been as soon as the dog looks, I'm going to mark. So I don't, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, especially for those of you, if you're not familiar with some of these concepts, don't worry so much about it. Um, but if you are and you have that question, that's sort of essentially the difference. And I will use up, down, but I'm always going to be sure that we have a lot of distance. So I'm not going to be out on a walk and there's a dog just across the street and tell somebody to stop and start playing up, down. Um, I'm always going to be getting lots of distance. You know, we're going to be moving up a driveway or moving into somebody's yard or getting a lot of distance before we start to play the up, down game. Um, and then I'm not going to be cueing the dog to say, hey, there's something over there. I'm just going to keep playing the pattern. If the dog notices the other dog within that pattern, um, I'm, you know, they are allowed the time to assess and then re-engage with the pattern. If they don't re-engage with the pattern, whoops, we didn't get enough distance. We didn't do our setup correctly. Um, but ideally, they're able to disengage very quickly and come back to the pattern or stay in the pattern. So hopefully that clarified for you, Jackie. And I also hope I didn't confuse everybody else. Um, okay, so I use, and let me just read the rest of it. So she says, I use up down to calm him and he's allowed to look around and then look back at me. And I reward the look back at me also incorporating take a breath in. Yes, that is absolutely correct. How you would do up down in that context. You are not confusing the system. You're just using up down instead of look at that. <laughs> um, and I would say the thing with look at that is you can play look at that on the move, whereas up down you have to be stationary. Um, so that's one advantage of doing look at that is, as I said, I could be walking along with my dog and my dog could be telling me about something as we're going. Um, and we could keep having that conversation as we're walking along. We're not stuck in one place um, within that pattern. So that's something else to think about as to which one to do. Is it ever too early to add the cue or question to the practice? Um, so you would want to do it. So I didn't, I didn't show you a video of mat steps, but essentially when you're teaching, look at that from the mat, you go through, um, Mat step two is open bar, close bar. Um, so for those of you that may not be familiar with that term, open bar is where treats become available and closed bar is where the treats stop. And it's a classical conditioning. So it's, you know, Pavlov's dog, the bell meant that the dinner was coming. Therefore, when the dog heard the bell, the dog would start to salivate. That's classical conditioning, learning by association. Bell means food. Um, and this scenario, um, it's where somebody approaching causes the treats to happen. So somebody would approach and stop at a specific station that would open the bar, treat, 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 person turns and walks away, bar closes, treat, stop. So our goal in this step is that the dog starts to figure out that the person being there is what cues the treats. And so the idea is that we want the dog to go, hey, come back here. I want the treats to start again. Um, we are in this context, not re our goal really isn't to condition them to want somebody to come over, although it has that side benefit. All we really want is for the dog to figure out that the person means treats are coming. So the dog starts to pay attention to the person. So essentially we've set it up so that the dog is looking towards the person because that's our end goal, right? Um, well, not our end goal, but our, our end goal in terms of Matt step two. So the dog starts noticing the person. So step three is where we start to shift to marking when the dog notices the person. So at first it was treat start when the person is at station, treat stop when they leave. Three is person starts walking, dog looks at person and we go click and we treat. And dog looks at person, click, treat. Dog looks at person, click, treat. So now we're marking for looking. So then we start to get the behavior where dogs are like, oh, there they are, click, you know, there they are. There they are. <laughs> so we've essentially got this. The dog is reporting to you where the person is. Great. Once that is happening pretty predictably, that's where we add the cue. 
And again, this is with a neutral person or a person that the dog is familiar and comfortable with. So we are introducing the cue in a context where the dog is fully comfortable and it's a fun game. That is the key. That's how we get that positive. This is a fun game. We, because we are playing the game in a fun way with neutral stimulus or stimulus that the dog is comfortable. Um, and yes, lots of practice at home with all of those neutral things. It could be other animals in the house. It could be people in the house, lots and lots of practice. You could try it outside in the backyard with those same things. Or if there's something neutral in the backyard. So if your dog is not excited about squirrels running by, if that's not overstimulating, you could play look at that with squirrels. Um, if it is overstimulating, then that would be way down the road once the dog has practiced being calm um, and comfortable playing the game. Okay, there were some other questions. Let me come back here. Okay. So Colleen said, could the one, two, three pattern be used to reinforce the dog for orienting back to you when seeing a trigger? The original version of one, two, three, the pattern is that the treat becomes available on three. So it is not dependent upon the dog's behavior. Um, so there is a voluntary version that involves the start button of the dog orienting to you, but the original version, the dog can be doing anything and the treat still becomes available on three. Um, so we're not really reinforcing any specific behavior. That being said, if we introduce it correctly and slowly start to build stuff in, it, you essentially get a dog that is healing but we're not trying to get that per se. We're just trying to get a dog from point A to point B, um, utilizing the one, two, three pattern. And the contract within that pattern is that whenever I say three, you're gonna get a treat. Um, now, the yes, so the voluntary version you don't do the next rep until the dog looks at you. So yes, you could be essentially doing that when the dog, when there is another dog in the environment. And if you've, if you've set it up correctly, then yes, the dog is essentially going to eat the treat and then look up at you to tell you to do the next rep. And between eating the treat, they may look at the other dog, but as soon as they look up at you, that cues you to do the next one, two, three. And if they're doing that, then they're under threshold enough that they're able to notice it but remain in the pattern. Um, and so, yes, you could look at it as reinforcing them um, for, for noticing the trigger and all that, but really um, it's up to us to be sure that we're setting the dog up so that they're able to notice something without reacting. Um, and so they're having control over you continuing the pattern. So you stop and wait for them to tell you to do that next rep of one, two, three in the voluntary version. But yes, essentially with them coming back to you, you could look at it as reinforcing them re-engaging with you. Okay, any other questions for me? Oh my goodness, so many, so many things. While you, while folks are looking for their last final questions, um, a couple of quick notes. Again, this is being recorded, so I will hopefully send out the link to everybody tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, definitely uh, check in with Angie. Or Angie, did you have more slides? Sorry, that's what I'm looking. Um, I got all excited. I know. No, you're fine. I, I, the, I was just going to mention, and actually, this is actually perfect. I'm just going to mention that there is a new um pattern game that we can go over in the pattern games one but it's incorporated with look at that um i talked about look at that being a behavior chain where things in the environment cue the dog to um check in with the person focus on the handler um this one was developed because somebody said i just want my dog to be a dog <laughs> like i don't want them to be coming over and telling me about it i want them to be able to just do dog things in the presence of a trigger um and so leslie developed this new pattern where it incorporates um decompression stations so natural behaviors for the dog so lots of sniffing or licking or foraging 
um, all those sorts of things that help the dog learn to engage with the environment in that context. Um, I don't have a video, but I just sort of wanted to leave it at that. So if you um, are interested in that, um, there are some talks that Leslie has done recently. Um, I think she talked about it at, on the um, Hannah Brannigan podcast, um, Drinking from the Toilet. It may have been mentioned in the recent um, By the End of the Dog. And if you um, saw the conference, there were some great um, video of them doing that with shelter dogs. It's worked really well. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there, but you can go ahead and take it away, Miranda. <laughs> There we go. If you are, uh, if you're interested in latte, Leslie did actually talk about it on the bitey end of the dog. So for those of you who are interested in aggression work, the bitey end of the dog is a phenomenal podcast. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Control Unleashed, we are probably going to be stealing Angie to run some classes soon, some virtual Control Unleashed classes. So if you're interested in that, just email me at Miranda at everydogaustin.org um, with something in it that says Control Unleashed. And that way I will let you know when when we have things up and running and we will likely try and get Angie scheduled for another webinar all about pattern gains at some point coming up. So check out our other webinars, everydogaustin.org slash webinars. I will send out the video recording tomorrow. And if you are so inclined, we would really appreciate any donations that help to make things like this possible. Um, thank you so much for coming out today and a huge thank you to Angie for for all of this fun information and all of the great videos with great music, I'd like to say. Um, so thank you so much for being here um, and we'll see you soon. I'm okay. I'm just don't sign yeah. off yet. I mean, you can, but I, on the chat, I'm just going to add those links. So I'm waiting for my thing to come up, but I'll add the Perfect. link to um, the take a breath video for sure. And then um, actually let me pull up my share screen one more time. Cause I'll put it yeah. to the slide at the end that has, all the um, great places you can go to access more about Control Unleashed. So let me reshare my screen. Where are we? There we are. And then while that's up, I will. Oh, Angie, you froze for a second. Angie? Oh. Think we might have lost Angie if she doesn't come back. And if oh, wait, I see you. There, we're back. You made it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, let me try sharing one more time. No, nope, not that one. That one. Okay, can you see the slide now? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Lots of great. So I didn't resources. go over start button today. Yeah. So I didn't go over start buttons today, but feel free to check out that. I will definitely go over that in the pattern games one, but Leslie McDevitt's YouTube page, my YouTube page, and then the Friends of Control Unleashed Facebook group is a fabulous, fabulous resource um, if you are not already on there. And then I was trying to pull up my take a breath one, but I guess if you go to the YouTube page, you'll find it there. So Perfect. Thank you. So many, so many good links. And if you have questions, that was Angie's contact information. It'll be at the end of the, the presentation when I send it out. So don't hesitate to reach out to her if you've got questions. If you need anything from us, reach out to us anytime. And like I said, we are hopefully doing some Control Unleashed classes soon. So if you're interested, shoot me an email and I can let you know when we're ready. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.